All right, let's get started. So hi, everybody. Good evening. I'm Dr. Peter Lin. I'm a family doctor in Toronto. Um, uh, and uh, it's it's really a pleasure to, to host this particular event. Um, this is on behalf of Recipe Plus and CTS. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you today to today's webinar called Prevention of COPD Exacerbation and Mortality. And this was co-developed by the Canadian Thoracic Society, Recipe Plus, and AstraZeneca as well. Um, let me just introduce you to you the topic for this evening, prevention of COPD exacerbation and mortality. Um, and we're going to have um, Joshua present to us, Joshua Wald. And we also have Dr. Lisa Melinchek, okay, Chuck. Uh, we have two experts here tonight. And Joshua is trained uh, respirologist at McMaster University, fellowship at the Montreal Chest Institute in pulmonary rehab and also chronic disease management. And thankfully, he returned to McMaster at St. Joseph's Hospital in Hamilton where he leads the inpatient COPD service and also helped found the COVID, uh, the COPD post-discharge clinic. Uh, he's a member of the Canadian Thoracic Society Assembly on Co uh, COPD steering committee uh, and his clinical and uh, uh, research interests are focused on pulmonary rehabilitation and comprehensive care of patients with COPD. Uh, we also have Lisa, a trained at um, med school, was actually McMaster as well, and then internal medicine at Queen's, and then cardiology fellowship at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute, uh, fellowship in advanced heart failure and cardiac transplant at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, and also did master's degree in clinical science and epidemiology at Harvard Public Health, like as if she didn't have enough time to tie up. <laughs> so amazing. Uh, she's the associate professor of medicine at the University of Ottawa and is a cardiologist and clinician investigator at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute. Uh, in addition, she's the director of the heart failure program and medical director of the cardiac transplant program as well as medical director of the pulmonary hypertension clinic. So any question you have to deal with this area, uh, we've got Lisa here to help with that. And really what we're looking at is the interplay between COPD and also cardiovascular disease. And more importantly, you know, why did these people die? And can we do something to change that? So that's really the focus of tonight. And I think that's why we have such a huge crowd turnout um, because this is an interesting intersection. We've had intersection between cardiology and diabetes, cardiology and, and, and nephrology, so the cardiometabolic renal um, side of things. And now we're starting to branch out into the cardio respiratory kind of uh, uh, paradigm as well. Um, uh, let's get the slides going, and then I'll just take you through some of the accreditation kind of issues, and then we'll get the program uh, started. So basically, you, here are your presenters for this evening. Uh, next slide, please. And here are the scientific committee members that put together this program. So even though it was sponsored by AstraZeneca, basically they were the financial supporters, but they didn't have anything to do with content. And this is the faculty that put together the content. Next slide. These are the conflict of interest for each one of us. And you can see we've worked with companies before. Uh, I've done it only in education. Many people have done it in research as well. Next slide. Disclosure of financial support. So we want to acknowledge the sponsorship from AstraZeneca through an unrestricted educational grant. Cardio uh, Canadian Thoracic Society and Respi Plus were the folks that did all the heavy lifting in terms of the content development, along with the planning committee, of course. Um, AstraZeneca does have products in this particular area. If we do mention it, just make sure it's very scientific. It's backed up by studies. And also all the generic names will be used uh, whenever possible. Next slide. Potential biases, no off-label indications will be discussed. All comments will be uh, coming from peer-reviewed published evidence. Everything will be flagged and referenced properly. And anything from a guidelines will be flagged as a guidelines recommendation. Next slide, please. The CanMed rules, so this is part of the family physicians thing. These are the things that hopefully we will become good at after this session. So to become a medical expert in terms of the content, a good communicator to explain this to our patients, a collaborator, a leader, health advocate and scholar. These are the things that we try to do for our patients. And hopefully this program will give us the tools to do that. Next slide. So the learning objectives, there are many sitting here. So basically we have to put all those verbs there. So recognize the missed opportunity of making the diagnosis of COPD. Um, think about effective treatment that would treat those exacerbation-like events. Understand the challenges that patients face when they have exacerbation and discuss the importance about mortality and in COPD. Uh, and the complication of exacerbations is death. That's one of the complications of that. And so therefore, can we prevent it? And then this concept of the right patient, right treatment, can we actually reduce the morbidity and mortality for our patients and how to optimize our treatments of our patient 
uh, and perhaps using this living well with COPD program uh, might be a, a good thing for us where there's written action plans and things like that. So we're going to discuss all of those things. So hopefully tomorrow we can treat our patients with COPD uh, much more completely uh, and perhaps a little bit better than we're doing today. Next slide. The agenda, I'll just go over quickly, COPD exacerbations, including mortality, ACM is all-cause mortality acronym, and the CV event, historical perspective, go through a little case, ICS regimens, including the single inhaler therapy uh, for uh, acute exacerbation and all-cause mortality reduction, um, a single inhaler therapy to prevent cardiovascular uh, cardio vascular event mortality specifically, and the benefit risk adverse events of ICS because we're worried about inhaled corticosteroids in terms of pneumonia and mortality, what are the numbers around that, and combining pharmacotherapy and self-management approach with this written action plan so patients know what to do, and then we'll have questions and a discussion afterwards. So on that note, let me pass things over to Joshua who will take us through the content, and then we have Lisa joining us during the panel discussion. So any questions that you have, keep typing. I see already 12 questions are in the question and answer. Just keep them coming and I'll keep track of them uh, for the after, after the session. So Joshua, over to you. Great, thank you so much. And thank you everyone <clears throat> for being with us here today. Um, so we'll go through this, um, you know, ask you can type questions as they come up and then we'll address them at the end. <clears throat> So we're going to start by talking about COPD exacerbations and uh, how they affect prognosis, including mortality. So exacerbations, as we all know, are a hallmark of COPD, and they're one of the most important uh, features for patients, both in terms of what they cause in terms of symptoms and uh, what they may uh, portend in terms of, of worsening issues over time. Um, so we define an exacerbation as an acute worsening of respiratory symptoms that requires additional therapy. So unfortunately, there is a bit of um, subjectivity in that, um, which we haven't been able to get away from. Um, but nonetheless, um, you know, for most patients, it becomes fairly obvious. When patients are having worsening symptoms, which is usually cough and phlegm, can include wheeze and, of course, dyspnea, um, then that's considered an exacerbation. Um, and then we can basically describe it as being mild, moderate, or severe based on what actions the patient needs to take. So mild exacerbation, um, the uh, additional therapy may just be using their short-acting bronchodilators more regularly. Moderate would be where they're prescribed an antibiotic or a steroid or both to treat it. And severe would be where there's an emergency room visit or hospitalization associated with that exacerbation. Um, and the interesting thing we see, <coughs> excuse me, is that um, as, we, as the frequency of exacerbations increases uh, after a first severe event. So what that means is once we have one severe event, we're more likely to have future severe events. When we look at lung function in relation to exacerbations, we can actually often detect a fall in lung function before the patient begins to experience symptoms. And more importantly, is if we follow the patient after that exacerbation, even with appropriate treatment, we often see that lung function is slow to recover and may never recover back to the baseline they had before that exacerbation. So it can often lead to an irreversible loss in lung function. So patients who are having frequent exacerbations may lose lung function at each point, leading to higher risk and further exacerbations in the future. Um, and this is especially important if we think about the high percentage of unreported exacerbations. So patients may not recognize that they're having an exacerbation, um, you know, certainly in my clinical practice, and probably those of you who, who see patients clinically will uh, recognize this where, you know, I talk to my patients about exacerbations or I'm seeing them for the first time and they say, I ask them if they've had an exacerbation, they say no. And I probe a bit further and they say, well, I had bronchitis two times last year and I had pneumonia the year before, um, but they may not be recognizing that. They may not be going to see a doctor. They may not be getting therapy. And th that could uh, indicate the silent irrevocable loss of lung function over time. So not only that, but we know that exacerbations are extremely important prognostically. So uh, the frequency and severity of exacerbations um, can help us to predict uh, future mortality. So what you can see in uh, the graph on the left there is we've got three uh, sort of patient trajectories um, with the, uh, as the curves go down, that's a decreasing probability of survival. So group A with a, the best uh, probability of survival has no exacerbations. Group B has one to two and group C has uh, three or more exacerbations. So there's clearly, a, 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 in, a, in a sense, a dose response where the more exacerbations people are having, the more likely they are 
to uh, be dying from their disease. And uh, we know that after a single severe exacerbation, the rate of subsequent exacerbations increases and the time between exacerbations decreases. So um, it, you can very quickly get into a vicious cycle where patients are declining more quickly. So really when we see exacerbations, we need to be acting aggressively because um, the, we, that maybe uh, the first exacerbation is portending not only mortality, but also future exacerbations that will further increase the risk of mortality if we don't make a change early. <clears throat> and if we look, excuse me, <clears throat> if we look at the leading causes of death worldwide, um, and we compare numbers from the year 2000 to 2019, what we see generally is some encouraging signs in some of the leading causes of death, like ischemic heart disease and stroke. Uh, so, um, so Lisa's uh, side of things has had much more success than we have in lung disease, where they've seen substantial decreases, while chronic obstructive pulmonary disease uh, mortality has actually been increasing, um, as has uh, lung cancer and some other uh, causes. So we know that uh, not only is COPD a one of the leading causes of death, but it's one where we haven't really made a big impact on the overall burden of disease worldwide, and it's actually getting worse. Um, so this is a sort of an old idea uh, that I think deserves a reanalysis. Um, you know, when, when it comes to uh, cardiovascular disease, heart attack, we everyone thinks of that as being a very important event uh, with a high risk of mortality and also that it, it portends a future risk and requires aggressive therapy. So at, at one point there was a push to call a COPD exacerbation a lung attack. It hasn't really taken off for a lot of reasons, but I think there is some useful things in this idea of thinking of a COPD exacerbation as a lung attack and equating it to a heart attack. And, um, and I think, you know, again, those of us who, who work in hospitals, we see a lot of patients being admitted for COPD exacerbations. But I think if you asked most of us to estimate the risk that those exacerbations would have for mortality, we'd probably underestimate that risk. So this was a uh, European Respiratory Society audit survey that you see here from 2013. It was uh, cross-sectional and multi-center, and it looked at the outcome of COPD patients after a hospitalization. It was quite large, 16,000 patients. And what they see was that within 90 days of admission, 6.1% uh, of patients had died, um, which I think is a lot higher than most people would expect. And not all of these patients died from respiratory causes, as we'll see, we'll talk about a little bit later. A lot of them died from uh, cardiovascular causes, but nonetheless, the exacerbation uh, was, was sort of um, a clear driver in the sense that um, when we looked at the in-hospital plus 90-day mortality, um, there was 11% of patients had died, which is, uh, you know, obviously shows that that exacerbation clearly had a major impact on their risk of death in those uh, three months. Um, and speaking about the component of cardiovascular risk, so as I said, a lot of these patients aren't dying of respiratory causes. Many are, but many are also dying of cardiovascular causes in the uh, time during or uh, shortly after they've had an exacerbation. So you can see on the left there, if we look at cardiovascular events in the first 10 days after a moderate exacerbation, so remember moderate means they were treated with steroids or antibiotics or both, but they didn't need to go to the emergency room. They didn't need uh, hospital admission. So these are not patients who are severely ill. Um, and what we saw is that in the first uh, five days after that exacerbation, there was a two-timed increased risk of myocardial infarction and a 40% increase in the risk of stroke. Um, and if we look at uh, the SUMMIT trial, which is the data you see on the right, the risk of cardiovascular events persisted for up to a year after an exacerbation in that study, where they saw four times increased risk of cardiovascular events, which could be CV death, MI, stroke, unstable in China, or TIA. So four times increased risk in the first month, and a total of 90% increased risk uh, between the uh, day 91 out to a full year, as compared to people who had no exacerbations. So clearly, the, it, not only is there a high rate of death of surrounding an exacerbation, but the presence of an exacerbation seems to be a trigger for uh, adverse events and death, uh, which can be respiratory, but can also be cardiovascular. And if we think about this mechanistically, it does make sense. At first, it, you know, it may seem a little bit counterintuitive, but but when we go through it, I think it does. Uh, you know, there there are biologically plausible mechanisms by which these are related. So, you know, first of all, there's shared risk factors. So, of course, everyone who has COPD 
uh, has had some kind of environmental exposure, usually cigarette smoke, but it could be, you know, air pollution or indoor biomass fuels or occupational exposures, but they've had some kind of exposure, which uh, leads to lung damage. And those exposures are also linked to cardiovascular risk. Uh, patients with COPD also tend to be older, um, which also increases your cardiovascular risk. So there's a lot of shared risk factors. All of our patients with COPD are at risk of having cardiovascular disease, uh, which may or may not um, have been identified at that time. Then when you have an acute exacerbation of COPD, that leads to increased uh, hyperinflation in the lung, um, as well as often to hypoxemia and systemic inflammation. And that can have a further impact on the heart, leading to increased cardiac afterload, decreased ejection fraction, and overall increased uh, myocardial oxygen demand and changes in coronary pressures that can increase the risk of plaque rupture and acute, uh, acute coronary syndrome, as well as stroke and heart failure. So uh, it, we have evidence that exacerbations are associated with cardiovascular uh, problems and, and, and acute events. And we also have a plausible mechanism by which exacerbations would increase your risk of cardiovascular events in the period after you've had one. Um, so now we'll move on from uh, the evidence around exacerbations and start talking about treatment. So, um, and we're going to talk about inhaled corticosteroid regimens, um, including this uh, SIT, which is the single inhaler triple therapy um, for acute exacerbations and all cause mortality. So, We'll start off just, you know, it's always helpful to have a case uh, to help sort of ground our thinking in these matters. So, um, you know, uh, we'll start with this. And, and as we go through the case, I just want uh, everyone to kind of think about what the uh, standard of care would be right now, what we'd be thinking about for a patient you saw with the, who looked like this. What else, what other tests you would order, what you would be telling this patient if there'd be any other referrals. And then we'll come back to her after we've uh, talked a little bit more about the evidence, and, and I'm curious to see if people's sort of mindset about what they might do for this patient will change. So this is a 65-year-old woman. She has she complains of shortness of breath, which has gotten worse in the last year, and she's currently an MMRC of three out of four, despite rehab program and exercise two times a week. And remember, uh, that means that she's becoming breathless walking about 100 meters, so pretty limited by breathlessness. She has uh, moderate exacerbations requiring antibiotics and prednisone about once per year. Um, so you can see there her history um, and background. Uh, her exam is fairly normal. Um, she's an ex-smoker with a 40-pack year history with a family history of asthma and a father who died of lung cancer. And she's currently on um, some medications for high blood pressure, as well as a long-acting muscarinic antagonist. Uh, so that would be something like Spiriva, for example, um, or and a short-acting uh, beta agonist, uh, something like salbutamol, um, and you would want to, of course, assess her technique with these. So keep her in mind as we go through, um, you know, this is, and, and, you know, I will say personally, you know, as of, uh, you know, a, a few years ago, this is someone who I might be thinking about dual bronchodilator therapy in based on her symptoms, um, but uh, the evidence I'm going to present to you um, may make you want to rethink that, certainly made me want to rethink that. Excuse me. Um, so we'll, we'll think, think about that as we go through the next section. So again, those of us who see COPD, every time you're seeing a patient, your goals are to reduce symptoms and, and to impact risk. So we've gotten reasonably good at the symptom piece, relieving symptoms, improving exercise tolerance, increasing health status. In terms of reducing risk, um, what we'd like to do is prevent disease progression, prevent and treat exacerbations, and ideally reduce mortality. Um, and that is the area where we've struggled the most up until now. And that's where I think um, this you know, recent data is going to be very interesting for people and hopefully we'll generate some discussion in the next part of this uh, webinar. So in terms of reducing risk of mortality, we've known for ages that smoking cessation and long-term oxygen therapy are beneficial. Um, but you know, obviously that has not been that 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 is leaving a lot wanting. A lot of our patients are sick and dying from COPD despite these interventions. Um, and it would be nice if uh, our inhaler regimens and the inhaled corticosteroids could impact mortality. Um, but that's been elusive. Uh, but there's some interesting recent evidence that we will go through to then discuss about that. 
So in the older studies, sort of famously, we were not able to show a benefit in mortality when we were looking at uh, inhaler therapy for COPD. And I think, you know, TORCH and SUMMIT trials are, are two of the sort of most famous ones, um, you know, published in, uh, in the early and mid 2000s. Um, both were powered for a primary outcome of all-cause mortality and both failed to show a significant benefit for ICS lava compared to placebo. Um, but it's important to look at what at, at those studies. They are quite old now, and uh, you know, they were completed you know, 15 years ago or so. And, and their inclusion was different than how we would look at inclusion for similar studies done today. So in TORCH, they had a pre-bronchodilator FEV1 of less than 60% was considered, that was how they tried to identify patients at high risk for mortality. And there was no requirement for previous exacerbations. So, you know, we now know that, you know, having an FEV1 of less than 60% on its own may not actually be that high risk on its own. It really depends on other factors, especially exacerbations. Summit was similar. They had to have a history of or risk of uh, CVD. And they had to have an FEV1 of 50 to 70% predicted. Um, and most of them had no prior exacerbations. 75% uh, had none in the last year. So we may not have identified a population at sufficiently high risk of dying. Basically, these studies were underpowered because the uh, incidence rate of the outcome they were looking for, all-cause mortality, was quite low in these studies. So that's where we come to trying to personalize therapy and trying to identify a population at high risk who's more likely to benefit. So these older studies, ISOLD in 2000, TORCH in 2005, INSPIRE, UPLIFT, SUMMIT, all of them had no requirements for previous exacerbations. Um, you know, SUMMIT had the, was looking at patients with risk of CVD, but, but often most of them did not have exacerbations. If we look at the most recent studies of uh, triple inhaled therapy, uh, and single inhaler triple therapy. We have ethos and impact, and both of these were enriched at study entry for patients at high risk of exacerbations. So most of these patients had two or more moderate exacerbations or uh, one or more severe exacerbation in the last year, which means uh, based on the gold that they would be considered at high risk of future exacerbations. Um, so if we look at these studies in a bit more detail, IMPACT had over 10,000 patients and ETHOS had over 8,000 patients enrolled. Um, and they both allowed prior diagnosis of asthma, but not current asthma. Um, and patients had to be on at least two or more inhaled maintenance therapies at time of screening and still have a CAT score of 10 or more, um, as well as an FEV1 of less than 50% and at least one moderate or severe exacerbation. Or if their FEV1 was higher, then they had to have two moderate or one severe. And if we look at who they actually enrolled, 70% of patients were high risk for exacerbations. So again, that meaning that 70% of patients had at least two moderate or one severe exacerbations in the last year, as compared to Summit, where 75% had had no exacerbations in the last year. So that's the biggest difference in these studies compared to those older trials and, and the other studies that were done. And uh, in IMPACT, they looked at a um, combination of fluticasone, furate, umiclidinium, and volantarol versus the uh, dual components in a single uh, device, which was the elliptic device. And in ethos, they had uh, four comparison arms um, where they compared budesonide at two doses along with glyco um, formoterol and glycoperonium. Uh, and they compared those to, again, the dual components. Um, and so what this is showing you is the annual exacerbation rate um, and what you can see there is that the blue columns are triple therapy. Um, and in, for the ethos trial, the two uh, columns next to each other that are both low, the, the blue and red is for the high dose versus low dose uh, inhaled corticosteroid. Whereas of course for impact, there was only one dose of inhaled corticosteroid. And what you can see for both of these is that there was a substantial reduction in annual exacerbation rate with single inhaler triple therapy versus the dual uh, components. Uh, and in impact, that was a 25% reduction uh, compared to dual bronchodilator and 15% compared to ICS LABA. And in ethos, similarly, 24% reduction and 13% reduction. Uh, so very, very similar results uh, between those two studies in terms of the uh, percentage reduction with tr uh, triple inhaler therapy uh, in a single device versus the dual components. Um, 
and so this is again uh, similar to what we said before. Um, this is looking at severe exacerbations, and again, you're seeing that uh, inhaled steroid containing uh, regimens, and particularly triple therapy, was more effective at reducing severe exacerbations. Um, so next, we want to talk about mortality. So again, this is one of the interesting things from these more recent studies that was they failed to show in the older trials. Um, they actually were able to show a benefit uh, to mortality. So um, both assessed all-cause mortality as a pre-specified endpoint. It was not the primary endpoint, like it had been in the earlier studies like TORCH, but it was, uh, it was specified as an endpoint that they looked into. So in impact, the hazard ratio for all-cause mortality uh, for triple therapy versus the dual bronchodilator component um, was statistically significant, with, and the point estimate for difference was 42%, which is pretty massive, actually. Um, it's rare you see impacts that size. Um, in ethos, um, when you looked at the high-dose triple therapy, so that was the 320 micrograms of budesonide, um, compared to the dual bronchodilator group, again, you saw a 46% reduction in all-cause mortality, and again, highly statistically significant. Um, so, you know, in both of these studies, we see that the, the triple therapy versus the dual bronchodilator therapy, not including an inhaled steroid, there seems to be a, a signal, a pretty strong signal for uh, mortality difference. And this is uh, looking at estimated absolute risk reduction in mortality. So the higher number here is better because this is the percentage that you're reducing the risk of death. So um, if we look at the single inhaled triple studies and we look at um, impact and ethos uh, separately, as well as the pooled analysis for, um, triple, for the uh, inhaled steroid uh, component versus non-ICS arms, we see that depending on how you, you look at it, there's between a 0.69 and a 1% absolute risk reduction in uh, mortality in this, in this patient population. Again, this was a patient population um, who was at high risk for exacerbations. And it's interesting to compare that to the impact that other interventions that you know, we think of as being extremely uh, strongly indicated to reduce the risk of mortality, what, how big the size of that impact was. So smoking cessation uh, had an absolute risk reduction of 0.16% uh, or 0.5%, or depending on which study you look at, but uh, nowhere near as high as the 1% reduction seen in ethos. And then, you know, if we look at some of the uh, older cardioprotective studies looking at uh, things like statins, we see that the, the magnitude of the effect for seen in impact and ethos is similar or greater than a lot of these cardioprotective treatments that are, have been standard of care for many years. So again, obviously, you know, this was a, a pre-specified secondary endpoint. It wasn't the primary outcome. So, it, you know, it's not, uh, not exactly comparable to some of these studies, but certainly just to give you a sense of the magnitude of the impact we're seeing, this is, you know, very patient important. If we have, if we had a therapy that we could show had a 1% absolute risk reduction in mortality, um, you know, that's something to get excited about. So I think, you know, even though um, certainly there, there's a lot of discussion still to be had and, and these studies are not, you know, we would love to have better data and, and more data to support this. I think, um, you know, the purpose of these slides is just to convince you that this is a really potentially very significant uh, result that we've seen. And, and I think it's worth considering changes to your practice based on uh, the potential benefit that we could be seeing from some of these, uh, again, in the right patient population. So this isn't that every COPD patient should be on triple inhaled therapy or inhaled steroid, but in those patients who are at high risk, those are the patients that seem to be doing particularly well. So going back to our case study, what would be the potential impact for this patient? Uh, and what kind of outcomes could you see for this patient? So uh, again, I want you to think about that as we go on to the next part. Um, and then we'll kind of circle back at the end. So next, I want to talk a little bit about, about single inhaler triple therapy to prevent cardiovascular mortality. Because when we think about in, inhalers, as we said, you know, a lot of the patients that we're seeing in uh, uh, mortality uh, at the time of exacerbation or within the weeks and months after an exacerbation, a lot of that mortality is actually cardiovascular mortality. So again, looking at the baseline demographic information, so the, um, what we're looking at here is data from the ethos study. 
Um, and as you can see, the, the different groups are fairly well matched in terms of age, male gender, frequency of exacerbations, bloody eosinophil counts, FEV1s, CAT scores, et cetera. Um, but the other thing we want to know is a little bit more about their cardiovascular uh, risk factors. So about 70% had at least one cardiovascular risk factor at baseline. And if we look at the four group across all the groups, we see is that the cardiovascular risk factors of interest were fairly well balanced. Um, so there really wasn't, we really can't attribute a difference in cardiovascular mortalities be between groups to a, different in base, to a difference in baseline characteristics, um, which means if we see a difference in cardiovascular mortality, it may be that that was caused by uh, the effect of the medication itself. And what we do see is if you break down the actual um, causes of death across the arms, what you can see is that cardiovascular mortality attribute uh, was a very significant cause of death across all groups, which is not surprising given what we know about the risk of cardiovascular mortality for patients with COPD, especially COPD patients who like the ones recruited for this study, who are generally at high risk of exacerbations. But we see that you know, the, the overall number of uh, cardiovascular deaths was significantly lower on treatment with an inhaled steroid, either the triple therapy or the budesonide for motorol combination therapy versus the um, dual bronchodilator therapy. So again, uh, if we want to hypothesize about a potential mechanism of action, why steroids were helpful in these patients, it seems to be mostly a reduction in cardiovascular mortality. And that may well be because of a difference in uh, exacerbation rate. And we know that exacerbations are associated with that increase in, in uh, cardiovascular events. So finally, coming back to our case, um, based on current uh, evidence, uh, what can we change? What changes can we make to treatment? So as I said, I think this is a case where prior to ethos and impact, um, you know, one moderate exacerbation per year um, and, and high symptom burden, you might, uh, and, you know, current guidelines might suggest that you could perhaps uh, escalate to lama laba uh, along with a short-acting bronchodilator. Um, but, you know, certainly as we move forward with this cardiovascular data and with the mortality data, it's worth considering whether a steroid-containing regimen would be worthwhile in a patient like this, including triple therapy. Um, so now, quickly, I do want to touch on the uh, potential adverse events of ICS. This is certainly something that always comes up and it is very relevant for our patients and particularly about the risk of pneumonia and, and whether or not our patients may be at risk of dying from pneumonia caused by the inhaled steroids that we're prescribing. So how do you ba balance those risks against the potential benefits? Um, so first of all, it's useful to look at the risk of pneumonia related to ICS and compare it to the risk of pneumonia caused by other factors uh, related to COPD. So what you hear, have here is the odds ratios of various risk factors for pneumonia. Uh, and so, uh, and what you can see is that the free use of oral steroids is a much greater risk factor for pneumonia than the use of inhaled steroids. Um, and things like current smoker, uh, older age, and uh, higher gold stage are much greater risk factors than ICS use. Um, so, there's also been a lot of talk about whether or not the risk of pneumonia related to ICS is a class effect or whether it depends on which uh, inhaled steroid you're using. So we did get some additional information in ethos and impact uh, that, that helped us to clarify this question at least a little bit. Um, they showed the clearest evidence yet that there's an increased risk for pneumonia for ICS containing medicines, which has been something we've seen across uh, studies going back to TORCH. Um, if we compare the non-ICS containing arms versus the, the steroid containing arms, what we saw was that impact ethos, both the impact showed a 1.6 fold increase in pneumonia and ethos a 1.9. So quite similar, um, you know, between those two studies. 
Um, and in 2016, a uh, European Medicine Agency report, they said that pneumonia, they suggest that pneumonia is most likely to be a class effect for ICS containing therapies. There's no conclusive evidence of interclass differences. So, um, you know, certainly my practice has been that uh, the dose of steroid is associated with increased risk, but the specific ster inhaled steroid that you choose uh, may not have a huge impact on overall risk because any steroid you pick is going to have a risk of incre increasing risk of pneumonia. Um, so the next question is how big is that risk and how do we weigh that risk against potential benefits? So in impact, what we saw was a number needed to treat uh, of four patients for one year to prevent one moderate to severe exacerbation. So again, remember moderate to severe means either an ER visit and hospitalization or a prescription for antibiotics and or prednisone uh, related to an exacerbation. Conversely, uh, oh, sorry, that's gone backwards. There we go. Conversely, uh, to cause pneumonia, so the number needed to harm was 33 patients for one year to cause one pneumonia. Um, so you can see the risk of pneumonia is uh, substantially outweighed by the um, risk of exacerbation for patients not on uh, steroid containing uh, uh, triple therapy versus dual therapy. Now, again, this is in a specific patient population. This is patients who are already at high risk. So obviously giving steroids to every patient with COPD is probably not the right lesson to take from this. But what, it, what we're really saying here is that if you pick your patients correctly, um, the benefit you're going to be providing vastly outweighs the potential harm. And of course, if, if the patient you're, you're treating um, is not going to benefit, then that harm is going to be uh, weighed much more heavily because it's not being outweighed by any benefit for that patient. If we look at mortality from pneumonia, we actually see there was no difference between ICS users and non-users, which is reassuring. Really what it's saying is that pneumonia-related really deaths are very, very infrequent and um, probably not that relevant for most of the patients we're seeing. Um, and I think uh, from a patient perspective, a case of pneumonia versus a COPD exacerbation that requires hospitalization, um, those two things are, are gonna be fairly equivalent for most patients because in either case, they're gonna be breathless and coughing. In either case, they may be hospitalized and be treated, but, uh, but the mortality, we don't see mortality related to pneumonia um, caused by ICS, which is reassuring. So finally, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the combination of these inhaled therapy techniques that we've talked about with uh, self-management approach and action plans. Because at the end of the day, no matter what inhaler therapy we pick and no matter how carefully we tailor our uh, therapy to the patient, we're never going to have a, risk, a zero risk of pneumonia or of exacerbations, excuse me. And with that in mind, um, an action plan is a really important thing for a lot of our patients to uh, help them manage an exacerbation and prevent it from becoming more serious. Um, so the idea behind a, an action plan, it allows patients with COPD to prevent worsenings uh, by identifying and treating them early. Um, if they're used properly, they allow patients to remain independent and they can start their treatment at home and avoid an ER visit or hospitalization. But, <laughs> they need to be used properly. So uh, one of the problems with an, an action plan, if you just give someone a prescription and send them on their way, is that often patients won't use it or they won't use it properly. Um, so what was seen in, uh, in this study published in Thorax in 2011 was that um, the recovery time from an exacerbation in days was significantly longer in patients who did not adhere properly to their action plan. And if you looked at the percentage of people who adhered properly, it was only about 40%. So if you, you know, people having an action plan with a written prescription can be really valuable, but only if they're using it uh, pro properly and safely. But if they do use it properly, they improve their symptom recovery quite substantially. So again, in addition to you know, a written prescription, having a written action plan uh, written out can be extremely helpful because it helps patients know uh, how to adhere to their medication properly. So this is an example taken from the Living Well with COPD program, which uh, is uh, administered through Respi Plus, who's a co-sponsor, co-developer of this uh, webinar. Um, and uh, it's uh, the website's there, www.livingwellwithcopd.com. Um, you can, uh, it's free to make an account, and then you have a lot of resources there, including um, you know, printable uh, written action plans that can be filled out with your patient. And it includes a contact list so the, so the patient and their 
family or caregivers know who to contact in the event of emergency. Um, it has the I feel well section in green, which I think is actually really important part of using an action plan properly, because what that allows people to do is track their symptoms day to day and know what they can do to maintain good health and what medications they're meant to be using on a normal basis. The yellow section, I feel worse, and that's when you know they may wish to, may need to initiate a written action plan with antibiotics or prednisone or both, helps them to understand when and how to use those medications. Uh, and then the I feel much worse, uh, and I, I am in danger, and that's really important as well. That helps people to understand when they should be either not either re searching for immediate help, going to the emergency room, when you know the action plan may not be appropriate or when it's not working, what to do next so that they don't become overconfident or avoid seeking medical attention until it's too late. So I do encourage everyone, if you haven't visited that website, take a look. Again, there's lots of examples of written action plans out there. Uh, this isn't the only one, but there's a lot of uh, excellent resources on that website and it's worth taking a look. So finally, conclusions take away. Um, we know for sure that patients uh, who are at high risk of exacerbation for COPD are also at risk of dying from of all cause mortality. Uh, and a lot of that is being driven by cardiovascular causes. We know that pharmacological treatment of COPD, um, that, that we have increasing evidence now that they can contribute to reducing mortality. I think this is super important. I think there's been a, a bit of um, nihilism around COPD in a lot of circles because of the failure to find treatments that definitively affect mortality, that that, that has contributed to, uh, you know, delayed diagnosis and less aggressive treatment. And I really hope that this evidence around mortality can help to change people's minds. I hope I've helped to change some of your minds. Um, maybe we'll be able to discuss that more in the question section. I think that the fact that, that we have inhaled therapy that can actually affect mortality is, is huge for our patients and hopefully for, for uh, clinicians' uh, approach to COPD. Finally, we're going to need to implement uh, better strategies to identify and characterize the patients who are going to most benefit from treatment. Because again, you know, the patients who are most likely to affect uh, mortality are the patients who have more severe disease, lower FEV1, more frequent exacerbations. But to get them on the right therapy, we need to know that they're having exacerbations and identify them um, in order to initiate treatment. Um, and these decisions can not only help our patients to stay out of hospital, but actually allow them to live longer. Um, and now I'll stop to acknowledge the, the team and uh, everyone involved, and uh, we can go on to the question section. Thanks very much, Joshua. You like my picture from like 4,000 years ago that, that I put up there? So anyway, so <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for that. That was beautiful. You took us through all the data, very heavy data over the last 30, 40 years, uh, and you were able to do that beautifully. And I understood everything that you said. Lisa, let's bring you into the conversation. Like, what are you feeling right now? All of a sudden, we've got a respirologist talking about death and, and reduction and, <laughs> and comparing to some of the cardiovascular trial. I mean, the, the percentages, what, what did you think about the, the slide that showed some of the traditional things that we, we so highly covet, you know, statin therapy and those kinds of things. And, and what's your thoughts on this whole area? Yeah, well, first, uh, I'll just say uh, to congratulations to Josh on a great presentation. Uh, if a cardiologist like me can learn something, uh, uh, from COPD and all these complicated uh, therapies that you guys have, then that says a lot because it is a very complex field that uh, I think most of um, my colleagues would agree that we we know very little about. So I really enjoyed your presentation. Thanks. You know, and I think it also goes to speak to the the you know the realization that our patients are your patients. Um, you know, although we tend to work a little bit, uh, and I'm a specialist, a super specialist, if you will, I look after a very small niche aspect of cardiology. Um, you know, my patients don't just have heart failure. My patients just don't have pulmonary hypertension or cardiovascular disease. They have lung disease as well. And, and although we work in the playground that we feel comfortable with, uh, we have to remember the whole patient concept and, you know, our, um, our, our, you know, exacerbations or our, our failure to optimize therapy on one end will, will result in, a, a, you know, a trickle effect or a domino effect for other chronic diseases. Um, and, and I, so I think that this kind of discussion is really important. And I think it's, it's very, um, you know, I really liked your conversation about the sort of pathobiology to explain the linkages between cardiovascular deaths in these patients. 
Um, and also just the, the pragmatics of care, right? That these recurrent episodes of exacerbations for our patients with COPD um, do put a stress on the heart. They destabilize heart failure. They create uh, stress demand ischemia, and they absolutely worsen cardiovascular disease. So I think when we talk about optimizing and preventing COPD exacerbations, we also need to talk about how we can optimize the cardiovascular system and, and ensuring that patients are on best practices on that side of the coin as well. Um, mm -hmm. and, and conversely for us as cardiologists who tend to kind of think in a narrow view of heart disease, um, you know, when we know our patients are actively smoking and we know that they've got a history of COPD, it, it's important for us to think about whether or not they're on best practice or whether or not we can help to encourage them to get the treatments that they need from the hands of the experts uh, to, 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 to minimize cardiovascular risk by optimizing their treatment for their chronic lung disease. Hmm, that's good. So in other words, cardiology is thinking about the lungs as well, which is amazing. <laughs> which is well, amazing. you know, absolutely. Beyond just fl looking for fluid, they should be thinking about right. the lungs as well, without a doubt. Yeah. Yeah, yep. no, that's great. Uh, there's a bunch of questions here. Let me just go through a couple of questions. And first of all, the, the other group, they they thankfully, they were able to type into the question answer section because our chat has been disabled. Uh -huh. I think it's to stop people from sending bad messages or drawing penises or something like that. Anyway, so <laughs> a completely different uh, topic there. Um, so so there were uh, physiotherapists, kinesiologists, a resident is there. One of the pharma uh, pharmaceutical representatives uh, is attending. Perry, thank you very much. I know you're, you're dedicated and that's why you want to learn more in this particular field. Uh, we have uh, nurse practitioners and, and uh, this commentary was that we should have a nurse practitioner, nurse separate, uh, we should have a bunch of separate categories. So thank you very much for all the other people for identifying your great profession uh, and all that you do for our patients. So a couple of questions popped up. One was, um, okay, so we have dry powder. Uh, and the, the commentary was that we have a triple in the, in the form of Trilogy, it's a good device, but dry powder still some older folks might not be able to get that up. So what is the, the new device? Is there something, you know, they were asking, is there something like a Respimat? Is it a, a, a PMDI kind of thing? What, what's the new device that you're, you're talking about? Yeah, so, so certainly that's always the concern with dry powder is whether patients have, you know, uh, sufficient inspiratory flow to actually get the powder into their lungs. There, there is actually a um, a device that you can get, uh, you know, that, that we have here from the uh, from the uh, reps for the device who that you can actually test whether or not your patient has sufficient inspiratory flow. So it's like a placebo device, but it, when they inhale, it'll make sort of a whistling sound if they're generating enough flow. Um, so you can use that if you're not sure. Um, but I agree that for some patients, you'd like to have something that has its own motive power, like an MDI or a recipe mat type device. Um, currently, we don't have any uh, uh, single inhaler triple therapy uh, in those formats available in Canada, but I think it will be coming. Um, and until then, you know, although the studies have, have been with single inhaler triple therapy, I do think that, um, you know, multi-inhaler triple therapy is, is probably, you know, we don't have the studies to prove it, but, uh, you know, it's, it's probably, I suspect, going to have a similar uh, impact um, as long as the patient is using it properly. So I think the key is that you have the device that the patient is able to use and willing to use and remembers to use. So Trilogy is nice because it's one puff once a day, easy to remember, easy to use, but it's not great. It's not perfect for all patients. So, you know, if you have a patient who needs uh, something that has its, its own motive force, you know, um, you know, something with an, in an MDI device um, with an arrow chamber plus a recipe mat device is a totally reasonable uh, therapeutic regimen for the time being. And hopefully we'll have a single inhaler triple therapy in those formats in the future. I, I know that they are, they have been tested, but they're not available in Canada yet. Okay. So the new uh, triple therapy, that's an MDI, that's a twice a day puffer. Do you have a, a preference of once a day, twice a day puffer? I think it just depends. For me, it just depends on the, the patient. You know, I think, um, you know, I have had patients who tell me that they find it much easier to remember once a day and they, they like it much better. I also have people who say they, they like the taking things twice a day because they, then they can feel it working. So, you know, to me, again, it, it, I don't, you know, I think the devices, you know, all these devices are well, uh, you know, research to deliver the medication appropriately, but it, but the key factor is the patient and if they're able to use it, if they like it. So I don't think there's, there's ever going to be a one size fits all. Um, I think it really 
uh, the best thing you can do is, you know, have a placebo device or ask the patient to bring in their device and see how they're using it and make sure that they're feeling comfortable with it. And if they're not, then you need, may need to change. So having more options is basically going to be awesome. better. Okay. Uh, there's a couple of comments here saying Brez tree is uh, the new triple single triple yep. inhaler therapy. Uh, and it's a PMDI device available in Canada as of last week. Okay. So, oh. Yeah. yeah. So it is available now. So, oh, okay. Uh, well, I'm behind also, the time. So yeah, yeah. And there's also uh, an LU code apparently that we can, we can get yes. that covered for people. Yes. So, so that, that's, that's exciting. That'll be excellent. And, and uh, uh, all right. Yeah. A couple of people said that apologies. Yes. Yeah. Um, no problem. This is clearly see, these people are up to date, man. They're up to date. This is why, okay. this is why technology has allowed us. And that's why I'm afraid about Twitter. No, anyway, that's amazing. Story, yeah. Um, no, and so, I, I think that's going to be fantastic. Cause I think, you know, again, having was more a good options question. is going to be better. Um, for ethos, did they use a spacer or did people just use the puffer device on, uh, in their, in their own form? I, I think they just used their puffer device from my understanding that there was no special mm -hmm. training or puff space or anything like that that went yeah in. that's a great question i wish i had that on the top of my head but you yeah. know i will say all of these uh clinical trials right they they always have uh, a lot of research staff who's you know and and they're checking in with patients regularly they're making sure that patients are adherent to their medication they're making sure that they're using them properly and and i think you know um so that's going to be something that's that's going to be when you do if you want to replicate the results of a clinical trial in your practice, you, you know, obviously you're not going to have those same level of resources. But, you know, if you're not making sure if you're not observing the patient using the inhaler and, you know, understanding how to adjust their uh, inhaler technique, uh, you may run into problems. The patient may just not be getting what you think they're getting. And my understanding is that there was no special training. People just used the device. And apparently the new new um, MDI devices, the new puffer devices are better than the old ones that we used to sort of talk about 20 years ago. So there would be better deposition yeah. uh, of, uh, of medication. So I think if people are worried about that, there didn't seem to be any extra uh, steps that you had to take. So that's good. And it's twice a day. And I find that some patients, they go, I want to take an extra puff at night. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and so the twice a day actually works okay, you know. Like and, the, yeah. And I don't know if it's, um, you know, placebo or what, but, you know, some people say, you know, when they're doing the once a day, they may say, I wake up and I feel like I'm, I, you know, I, I'm more breathless in the morning until I've taken that puff. It takes a little while to take effect. So again, you know, I think it just depends on patient preference. Right. Okay. A uh, couple of questions here about how do you sort out somebody that's short of breath? Because a lot of times when people come in short of breath, then we start wanting to send to cardiology. So, so Lisa, any thoughts about how do we separate out uh, cardiac versus respiratory? Uh, we were talking just before we came on about, you know, dyspnea. There's a lot of things that cause shortness of breath. So how should we in primary care, let's say, or a nurse practitioner or something, how do we sort out you know whom to send to or, or what to do yeah and and, and, it, and it is so difficult because as you say uh peter there there are many causes of shortness of breath they're overlapping and 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 our patients are never almost never going to have just one diagnosis so it is very difficult from the cardiac perspective um, you know, I think um, looking for um, signs or suggestions on history that there are other cardiac concerns. So asking about a history of chest pain, syncope, palpitations, uh, asking about symptoms of heart failure, which, you know, could be as obvious as peripheral edema or uh, less obvious as abdominal bloating, unusual weight gain, orthopnea, things like that, that are very specific to more of a cardiac diagnosis. And then two of my best friends uh, um, to, to, to reach for when I'm trying to sort out causes of dyspnea would be an NT pro BNP and an echo. Um, th these are objective measures that really can help refine your pretest probability of whether or not the shortness of breath is coming from the heart, particularly an NT pro BNP, notwithstanding that there are issues, uh, limitations with access across the country for sure. Only recently in Ontario have we had access for, to it. Um, and it is confounded by things like renal function and age and weight. So, so there are there are nuances there to be aware of. But a clearly normal NT pro BNP is it really does um, has a high negative predictive value for for heart failure as the cause of shortness of breath. And on an echocardiogram, if you're seeing abnormalities, certainly in systolic dysfunction, well, that's that's obvious. But if you're also seeing you know, uh, diastolic dysfunction, moderate valvular regurgitation, concentric remodeling, all these sort of subtle suggestions that, um, that, that the filling pressures are not normal, that should also point to a diagnosis of 
uh, some cardiac pathology. It may, again, may not be all the heart, but the heart is probably contributing to, to some uh, exercise limitation and probably does need some further consideration as well. No, that's a good point. So we can use these clues to kind of sort through the patient. And I've actually had a few that I sent to cardiology and then they quickly assessed and then sent it to respirology. <laughs> so, yeah. So yeah. I, I think and that, it was, be, that was good. it may be as simple as that, right? Just yeah. some reassurance that that this is not the major driver of the symptom limitation. So let's look somewhere else. And you know, unfortunately for our patients, they often do bounce around between our doorsteps and your doorsteps before we can find an answer. And, and a, a, again, sort of optimizing as best as we can optimize all elements to try to reduce that symptom burden that they have. And I guess yeah. as long as we think about the lungs as well, you know, I think that's that's kind of part of the pecking order that we've sort of left off. You know, it's always, you know, shortness of breath is is cardiology and then we yeah. forgot to pick them up afterwards. So maybe yeah. if we just think about it, that's good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, here's a couple questions about, Pre-specify, not pre-specified. So um, the all-cause mortality was a secondary outcome, right, in these studies. Exactly. And then one is pre-specified. I think ethos was pre-specified. So what's the importance um, of pre-specified versus not pre-specified? Right. Like saying um, that yeah, so I think, it. absolutely. So I think, so both had a, had all-cause mortality as being a pre-specified endpoint. Um, I think the, the important thing there is, you know, it's in the trial design at the start, which means that you've pre-specified not just that you're going to look for it, but how you're going to look at it. Because of course, if the you know once a study is complete, um, and if you haven't, if you go back and look at it without having pre-specified what you want to look at, you know you could do you know 400 different analyses, and you know there's all this talk about p-hacking. You know you can do different things to to create a signal from noise. So that's why if you don't pre-specify an outcome, it can be interesting, it can be hypothesis generating, but it, it's very difficult to argue that it should affect your practice until you, you know, it, because it's much too easy to generate a story that makes sense afterwards and then find data to fit your theory. But if you, go, if you start out and you say, we're going to look at all-cause mortality, this is our definition, this is how we're going to do it, um, you know, that mean, that takes that piece of it away. And that means that it's, it's much more powerful, um, be, you know, when it's come back positive, especially, you know, with sort of similar magnitude of benefit across two different studies looking at a similar population. I think, you know, it's obviously not, not as good as if you had a, a study whose primary endpoint was all-cause mortality powered to detect uh, mortality difference, um, but it's, it's sort of the next best thing. Okay, that makes sense. So one is fishing, and then the other one is you thought about it, and you're going to go look yeah. for it, and then you found it. <laughs> so yeah. that, that's kind of a good way to do it. And I think you're right. I mean, I think of things like a pyramid, right? So in other words, the top is mortality. What we really like to do is not have people die. The second is organ protection. So lung exacerbations, heart attacks, whatever, we'd like to prevent that. And then the final one is some surrogate marker, you know, like blood yeah. pressure, or, you know, so now we're going to the tip. And I think that's why um, I've never seen respirologists so excited like yourself, Josh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I see Lisa coming, joining in the party and saying, yeah. you know, cardiovascular death is a good thing that we're preventing. Yeah. And what, you know, and one thing I, I, I sort of, I like to say, I was tell, talking to residents here at McMaster today, you know, there's the saying, like, you go to war with the army you have, not the army you wish you had. I think in respirology, we, we go to clinic with the evidence we have, not the evidence we wish we had. You know, we, we have to make decisions based on the available evidence. So it's, it's good to nitpick the evidence and, and analyze it and, and look at it from both sides. But at the same time, I don't think we can let, uh, you know, let a wait for perfect evidence um, prevent us from making decisions based on pretty good evidence that we have now. Right. There is one question about ethos where there was two dosages of the ICS. So there's the normal dose, which is what we have in Canada, and then the half dose, right? So that's it's not high and low. It's more like normal and then half dose. But there was difference there. So that means the dosing is is important. That there that is a that is a vexing problem. I I don't have the answer for you. So yeah, you know it. There there's never the. The problem is, is that the different doses didn't show a different in difference in exacerbation mm -hmm. rates, but they did show a difference in mortality. And why that is 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 hard to um, hard to square given the mechanisms we're proposing. So, you know, I we don't really know. You know, my you know what I will say is, you know, four arms 
it, you know, it was a somewhat smaller study than impact. It had four arms instead of three. Um, so it's the comparisons between the arms for mortality are going to be even less powered than the ones you see in impact. If you look at the trend across the four groups, it's clear that th there's a clear trend where the um, high and low dose ICS groups are close to each other in terms of mortality, mm -hmm. um, with the with the lama laba group being the the highest mortality risk. So, you know, it, it's it's hard to know if it was just a power issue. And, it, you know, it, when you have a small number of events, you know, a few events could have led that uh, lower dose ICS group to being non-significant, mm -hmm. um, you know, but the trend is still there. And if you do, if you roll up all of the ICS patients in ethos and impact and look at them together, which again is doing that post hoc thing that I said you shouldn't do, mm -hmm. um, you know, you do still see that the overall signal is for ICS regardless of dose having an impact on mortality. So, so that's, a, that's a question we don't really have an answer to. And I think it speaks to the imperfectness of the data and um, you know, the, it's potentially underpowered. Um, so I'm, I, don't, I don't necessarily believe in a dose response relationship in regards to mortality because we haven't seen it in response to exacerbations, but, uh, but I suppose jury's still out from a purely evidence-based medicine perspective. Well, at least thankfully the dose that we've got in Canada is the, the normal dose that had the mortality, which is good. Um, so I, I see that we're slightly over time, so I, I apologize, but I think the conversation is so good and thank you all for the very good questions that you had. Um, so any final thoughts from Joshua and Lisa? Maybe Lisa, any final thoughts and then Joshua and then uh, I'll wrap things up. No, I think that it's a great discussion today. And I think a lot of the important elements have been uh, have been uh, addressed. Um, I think when we when uh, when you do see these patients with COPD, uh, keeping that high on your priority list that their that cardiovascular mortality and cardiovascular morbidity is very high for this group of patients, and so looking to ways to optimize their therapy. And it's you know as you say, it is absolutely about optimizing the treatment for the chronic lung disease to prevent the cardiovascular morbidity and mortality, but also uh, ensuring that they're on best practices for their cardiovascular disease. Right. So if they've got coronary disease lipids management, blood pressure management, antiplatelet therapy, risk factor reduction um, for heart failure prevention, all of those things are just as critical as uh, some of the very important things that were discussed here today and certainly uh, really uh, enjoyed the discussion today. So thank you. That's great. Maybe if we add them all together, people will never die. That'd be good. Right? So what, Joshua, one ginormous poly pill uh, right. and inhaler. One very big, big puffer inhaler. and yeah. one very big yeah. There you go. More, more, more links with cardio and rest. You're having you poly pills. We're getting triple inhale. That's inhaler, right. Putting inhaler. things together. Joshua, um, but, final thoughts? Yeah, I'd say my final thought. You know, I think, you know, I just re sort of building on what I said before, you know, I'd really encourage people to, uh, you know, think about, identification of COPD patients as being something that can improve their, their survival. Because I think that has been a huge challenge in getting people, you know, clinicians, policymakers, patients interested in COPD is this idea that it's just a chronic progressive disease and there's nothing we can really do about it, which, I, which, is, which is not true, I don't think. And this evidence is really showing us that there's things we can do. If you look at a graph of mortality in COPD over time, it's a, it's a steady downward trend. And I think you know, so a lot of our interventions weren't powered to look for mortality, but you know, good care for these patients does affect mortality. We see that in observational data, and now we're starting to see it in some of the clinical trials. So I think, you know, if I can, if I can have a call to action, you know, we need to identify patients with COPD and get them on treatment. It's not just about reducing their symptoms, although that's incredibly important, but it, it really does have an impact on their survival. Mm -hmm. That's great. And, and I think for some stupid reason, we all thought about it as a symptomatic disease and we we're just controlling symptoms that yeah. the lung wasn't getting worse, even though they kept having these attacks. That would be like waiting for the fifth heart attack and then say, well, maybe we should do something now. So so I, I think now we realize that that nice slide where you don't recover, right? In other words, you lose your lung function and you don't recover. That's that's the best sign that there is permanent damage there every time we go through an exacerbation. Uh, thank you very much for explaining what a mild, moderate, severe exacerbation is. I think we were all confused with that. And then thank you for giving us the data that says maybe this uh, triple inhaler, single inhaler therapy might be the way to go uh, in terms of protecting patients and not just exacerbation, but perhaps mortality as well. And I like the way you picked out that it, this isn't the higher risk people. So in other words, it's not for everybody, um, but definitely for even the lower risk people, the ethos kind of patients that may not have had exacerbations or uh, before, 
you were able to prevent exacerbation. So um, maybe in the sickest people, we can get death. And then in the less sick people, we get exacerbation benefit. That's that's still pretty good. So uh, thank you very much for both of you. Fantastic to see respirology and cardiology hanging out uh, and, and speaking the same language and looking at the same, same percentages, actually, like in terms of studies, because I think respirology um, never had mortality data to kind of put up onto that graph. So it's really great to have that uh, showing up there as well. Uh, so thank you very much for both of you for your time. And thank you to our audience for all those uh, uh, allied healthcare professionals, which we're going to put in categories in the future. Uh, what you guys do is amazing. So thank you all very much for your work and time and effort. And thank you for tuning in to kind of learn a little bit about this. Please fill out the survey monkey thing, you know, where you can tell us whether we did a good job or what we can fix. Maybe don't tell us that we did a bad job, just what we can fix. Uh, and if you like me, I'm Peter Lin. And if you don't like me, I'm Peter Liu. Um, so Peter Liu, poor Peter <laughs> Liu is having a hard time. And this is the Canadian Respiratory Conference that's happening in April. Uh, and it's in Montreal. So therefore, if you want to visit Montreal and learn a little bit about uh, respiratory diseases, I think that would be an exciting time. So to keep that in mind, uh, and again, it's the Canadian Thoracic Society putting on this uh, particular program. Uh, the chat box has the link for the survey. Uh, and please, everybody, take care of yourselves so that you can continue to take care of your patients. And thank you, Joshua and Lisa. Uh, I think we learned a lot so that tomorrow morning when I see my COPD patients, I'm going to be thinking uh, really hard about what I can do for that patient. So thank you both very much. Thanks. Take care. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.